Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for coming out to session G, where we will be discussing offshore wind, and we have two um, very exciting presentations coming up for you. The first one will be by um, uh, George Hagerman. He's the senior project scientist at the Center for Coastal Physical Oceanography at Old Dominion University. And his presentation will be on Virginia offshore wind research opportunities in mid ocean and environmental science. And a little bit about George. George worked at ODU Center for Coastal Physical Oceanography in Norfolk since January 2018. He has 38 years experience researching marine renewable energy systems, including offshore and wind power, wave power, tidal power, and ocean thermal energy conversion. Before coming to ODU, George was a research faculty member at Virginia Tech's Advanced Research Institute based in Hampton. And a little fun fact about George, he swims three ocean mile races sponsored by the Virginia Beach Lifeguard Association um, every year and is always amazed that he finishes. So please join me in welcoming George. So thanks everyone. Um, I tend to walk around, but I think if I do that, I'll probably just fall off the edge of the stage. I'll stay here. Um, and uh, again, it's a real it's a real pleasure to be here. And um, you know, I, I we've there's been periodic presentations when we had the Virginia Coastal Energy Research Consortium, which actually combines several universities. We've been doing offshore wind studies funded by the Commonwealth off and on since uh, 2007, really. And so. We're, I'm now at a point to really just uh, say, and some of you may know this already, but there are going to be two demonstration turbines uh, installed off Virginia um, in the summer of 2020. So what, what I'm going to be talking about is it's in the research lease that's held by the Virginia Department of Mines, Minerals, and Energy. And they are sort of the lead state agency under the Secretary of Commerce and Trade. They're the lead state agency for offshore wind advancement in Virginia. And you'll see a link at the very la at the end of this my presentation where you can go to get a, a lot more information. So I'm going to focus more on the med ocean and not so much on the environment because the speaker after me will talk a lot about the environmental issues. Because New York, the the off New York, it's still the same oceanographic space. It's the Mid Atlantic Bight, which is the the stretch of ocean between Cape Cod, Massachusetts, and Cape Hatteras, North Carolina. That's called the Mid Atlantic Bight, and you know, yes, there are more hurricanes in the southern and more nor'easters in the northern part, and, and the, the North Atlantic gray whale, our right whale, migrates between all those areas, but it really is a pretty common uh, ocean space. So I think the environmental issues that are encountered off New York are very similar to what we'll encounter, so Janine will, will, will brief you on that. And I'm going to focus on, on Med Ocean, and Med Ocean is a contraction of convenience. <laughs> Um, which is really a combination of meteorological and oceanographic, because you need to know both about what's happening in the atmosphere, obviously, for a wind turbine, and also what's happening in and under the sea in terms of the forces, particularly the forces on the turbine and the scour around the turbine foundation. So that's what I'm going to really focus on today. All right. So, and, and <laughs> talking about research without funding is sort of um, just vaporware, but we actually do have this this uh, National uh, uh, Offshore Wind Research Consortium that is 50-50 uh, funded by the U.S. Department of Energy and the New York State Energy and Research Development Agency, or NYSERDA. And they are, there are solicitations coming out in three research pillars, um, and there'll be PDFs of this, and you can go through it at, at, your, at your leisure after the conference, but the, the, the first solicitation and the one I'm going to talk about, because it does afford an opportunity to put in some uh, research proposals that we think will have a strong chance of being funded are array performance and control optimization. Uh, and the second topic that we're going to put in a proposal is in cost reducing turbine support structures for the U.S. market. And you'll see that's really important for Virginia because Virginia is probably better, better situated to cost competitively produce and supply offshore wind turbine foundations than any of the other states. Massachusetts, on the other hand, may be more competitively situated to produce blades. And I, I, can, I can answer questions about why that's so, but, but, but in, 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 the, in the case of Virginia, we have the, the nation's largest for any state, the uh, ship, uh, full-time shipyard workforce. We have tw nearly 28,000 full-time shipyard jobs 
that's more than all of New England and New York combined. So it is our sweet spot, but again, the other states, again, New York could do a nacelle and rotor assembly. There's a lot of, every state, the offshore wind opportunity is, is such a large rising tide that it will indeed float all boats. All right, so that's a little bit about kind of the background. Now I'm gonna get into more into the science and the technology. So this is when, when, when we look at, there are now 15 leases in, throughout the Mid-Atlantic Bight. I'm only showing five of the leases in this, or actually six of them in the southern Mid-Atlantic Bight. There are two off New Jersey, one off Delaware, Maryland, Virginia, and Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. So those are our, our six leases that are within a day's sail uh, if you're going at 10 knots with a transport barge. Uh, we're in a day's sail of Hampton Roads. And so this really is the market that we would want to sell our goods and services, and this is really the market pull for that would demand foundations or turbines or blades or towers. And so what is the size of that market? Um, and right now, the, the, all the official documents from the Department of Energy and the uh, Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, or BOEM, and they're the, they're the ones who actually manage the seabed and, and award the leases, um, they use three megawatts per square kilometer. So that's the, the sort of the, the amount of generating capacity you could put into a, a plot of ocean space. Um, but in, the, in Europe, they're actually, it's more, almost double that is being used in their planning exercises, which is nearly five and a half megawatts. And what I want to show you now is some really interesting simulations, and I'm going to stress that so far it's simulations, and what we're going to put in a proposal is to actually validate these computer simulations with physical full-scale testing in the field. Um, but the, the, the computer simulation suggests that you could even triple from three all the way up to almost nine megawatts per square kilometer. So from an environmental perspective, that's really good because now you're getting more energy from the same amount of ocean space and you don't have to build out three times as much, uh, which only increases your conflict with shipping or other ocean stakeholders. And also, of course, it creates more environmental impact on the seabed, and, and, and again, if, if, the, if, the, if the endangered right whale and other uh, whale species migrate around these wind energy areas, because they just, they, they don't recognize them, or, and we don't know that, we'll soon discover that. When we put the demonstration turbines up, we'll start to get a sense of whether they avoid these turbines or not. But one of the things that is certain is that if they do avoid them, and you've got ships avoiding them, now you're increasing the risk of collision because you're putting more ships in a smaller amount of ocean space and you're putting more whales in a smaller amount of ocean space. So we really, we really would like to get as much energy out of, a, out of an acre of seafloor as we possibly can. Um, this, I'm not gonna go into detail because this is the kind of visualization you get with a computer simulation that uh, the National Renewable Energy Lab has done. It's peer-reviewed science. And what they do is that it turns out that if you actually steer the wakes of the turbine away from the downstream turbine, even though it's not the most efficient way for the upwind turbine to get energy, the downwind turbine gets more energy and the, and the plot of area as a whole gets more energy. Uh, in this case, this particular six array simulation, it's 13%, uh, and one eighth more of the energy is, is provided if you, if you steer the wakes. So NREL then did the simulation. This is the model after the Princess Amalia wind park off the Netherlands. And it shows, um, and I'll try to point this out. So it shows that, again, if you start with a baseline in Europe, which is nearly five and a half megawatts per square kilometer, which is the same as watts per square meter, it's the same units, or the same number for that. It's just a different set of units, but you multiply everything by a thousand and you get megawatts, or a million, you get, meg you get megawatts per square kilometer. So anyway, so this is what they have as a baseline, but uh, even by, um, uh, just moving the, uh, just changing the steering the wake only, if they only do is the yaw optimization, they can get 5% more energy, even with a regular arrangement. If they then optimize the position of these uh, turbines, um, they can pack more in, and, and, but not so much effect on energy. But overall, if you combine both, you can get, again, 5% more energy, but you know, almost, uh, in this case, from 5.4 uh, 5 to 8.8. .8. So, so this is now all computer simulation. What we want to propose with this first solicitation is looking at can we actually do this in the field? And the, the first step would be to show this on land. And some of you who have been to northeastern North Carolina, Curatuck, their counties, and there are a couple of uh, uh, counties that begin with a P, and I can't remember them, and so I'm just going like, to roll right on through that and simply say that if you go south, if you drive south of Great Bridge in, 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 in Western Virginia Beach or what used to be Princess Anne County, 
you will see two, uh, 100 turbines, 104 turbines to be exact, um, that are, uh, were installed and it's a, it's a business to business arrangement between Avangrid, who also has the, the uh, offshore wind lease off Kitty Hawk, but that same company has this onshore project where they sell directly to Amazon. So this is the Amazon US East Wind project. Um, and so um, that's a, and they've already agreed uh, uh, in principle, we're still waiting for the solicitation to come out, but to actually uh, let, let our team point some LIDAR, some, some light detection and ranging laser instruments, Doppler instruments, to look at the wake, to actually m measure the wakes and do the wake steering and see if in fact it has the effect that we predict with computers. So we'll start on land because that's easier and not as expensive. But we know that water behaves differently than soybean fields and, and, and corn fields in terms of the, the effect on the wind. And so eventually we, we want to go offshore. And Virginia is unique among uh, all the states between uh, Cape Cod and Cape Hatteras. I mean, um, yeah, Cape Cod and Cape Hatteras is that Virginia has the first and only research lease, the RL2, this research lease. That we've actually also got an earlier application that was paused while we went ahead and finalized this application for the two demonstration turbines, which is the Coastal Virginia Offshore Wind Project. But, but one of the things that this new proposal opportunity will afford us is an opportunity to possibly build a new platform in, in, in the southern lease here, and it would have a range of 10 to 50, and at the extent of 15 kilometers, if it can see out that far with its Doppler technology, it could actually see the CVAO turbines. But you can see that if we can prove out a technology that has this kind of range, we can also map the entire area. So, so we're, really, we're really now trying to gain momentum in, in attracting funding, both federal and private and, and, and state funding, to really move forward in developing this, these research leases, this combination of research leases into a national offshore wind test bed. And, this, and again, we have this great unique thing in, in, in Virginia, which is the Chesapeake Bay Bridge Tunnel. So you can actually drive out in the third and fourth islands, which is the Chesapeake Channel. A lot of you may be familiar with the Thimble Shoals Channel, uh, which is now kind of disrupted by there because they're, they're widening, putting another, another tunnel in section in here. But out here, meanwhile, they're not. And so you've got the third and fourth islands. So you can actually drive out to oceanic conditions where the aerosol load and the atmosphere is like the ocean, the salt corrosion and, and, and the spray and everything that would affect equipment. You can just drive out there in a pickup truck, you can park a trailer behind a, a locked fence and you've got access to, to AC power and lighting. And so we're gonna test out these, these instruments, these Doppler instruments, the same one that we use at the Amazon wind farm, but we also wanna see how robust they are. Will they last out in the ocean? Because eventually, again, we wanna go offshore uh, and put them on a platform. So, so that's the first kind of proposal. The second proposal we're gonna look at is uh, and this is the second, sort of the second subject area, topic area that uh, the DOE and the New York uh, Energy Research and Development Agency, or NYSERDA, they're going to invite, inviting proposals on cost effective, more cost effective foundations. Right now, the, the foundation of choice, more than 80%, four out of five turbines in Europe, are done with a monopile. It's just a ginormous steel tube that's pounded into the sand. And that hammer energy, particularly as you get in larger and larger turbines, is very disturbing to marine mammals. So it cannot be, monopiles cannot be driven at night because the marine mammal observers cannot ob observe mammals. Um, the infrared detection of a whale, of a whale blowing, the R she blows, you can only not see very far with infrared, with forward looking infrared. So you can't really reliably detect when a whale is within a distance that would be, its ears would be harmed by this pounding sound. So there's just no construction at night and there's no construction during the migration season. So we think that by using a different technology, which has already been uh, proven in Europe, uh, is called a suction bucket jacket. So these are just uh, inverted, these cylinders are hollow on the inside, they're sealed at the top, but they have valves. And by drawing you know, water through the sediment and then up through, when you actually put a suction on these, on the, on the valves on the tops of these chambers, you actually suck the foundation into the seabed. So water flows through the sand, it liquefies the sand, and the combination of that suction pressure and the weight of the foundation, which is about 800, 900 tons, is going to settle it into the seabed, and there's no hammering. So you can install day or night, you can install any time of the year, and we think that's going to confer a tremendous cost advantage. Uh, this just shows you, we have, thanks again to DMME, with collaborative funding uh, uh, between our state and the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, we've got a lot of good geophysical data, 
Uh, this is the area that we've done some very tightly spaced tie lines here, so we know a lot about the, the sediment burden here, and it's certainly adequate for uh, uh, suction caissons. We even have a seismic tie line to the geotechnical cores that were taken for the two demonstration turbines, which will be here. And this ridge and swale topography, for those of you who are not familiar with marine geology or its history on the shelf, as, sea, as the sea, sea level rose after the last ice age, these were just relict barrier islands that, and lagoons that were drowned in place. Sea level rose faster than the barrier islands and lagoon system could retreat. So you've got, you've got uh, coarse sand and on the tops, and then you've got more lagoon-like clays and muds behind them. And, and this has all been validated with these studies that DMME and BOEM collaboratively funded. And, and this is the recent, this is the horizon, the seismic horizon of the, of the, of the uh, modern sand layer. And you can see we've got plenty of thickness to do a suction caisson type of uh, jacket. And so that's where we would like to put in a, a, a new build. If, if, our, if our cost studies show that, in fact, this, it, there is a lot of advantage to doing these, these jacket structures instead of pounding in a monopile, then we would want to then prove out the concept in our environment. Before you actually put a turbine on it, you could just put a MET mast. You could put a meteorological mast and all kinds of other instrumentation. And I'll just talk a little bit, and then I'll be wrapped up talk a little bit about some of the interesting experiments that we can do from a fixed platform that would be, again, located in this, this, uh, this southern lease once this lease is executed. And so, again, uh, backing up a little bit, so again, this is the Doppler signal for mapping the resource, and I wanna, the reason I call our attention to that again is, uh, and for those of you who aren't familiar with Doppler mapping, what that is is that, so when you hear a, a train or an ambulance or any kind of EMS vehicle, emergency responder go by, you know, the, the sound rises as it gets closer and it goes lower as it goes away. And what happens is that that sound wave is, is moving. And so the apparent wavelength that you hear in your ears either contracts as it's coming toward you and you hear a higher pitch frequency or when it's going away that it, or it sort of lengthens the apparent wavelength that your ears here. And the same thing happens with laser. If you do a laser light and it's bounced off an aerosol in the air, if the aerosol is moving away from the laser source, it's going to see a, a shift, a Doppler shift. It's called a Doppler shift in the wavelength. And, and by putting three lasers and varying them at angles and all kinds of electromagnetic wizardry and circuits, you can create these LIDAR buoys that can actually measure the winds up to 100, 200 meters above sea level, where you would just could never put a mast with a conventional cup anemometer. So anyway, so one of the reasons in, we cited these leases where they were because our winds come out of typically out of the north in the winter and out of the south, southwest in the summer and very little directly from the east or the west. So if you've got a, a Doppler instrument that's looking along the winds where they're going either toward the instrument or away, you're going to get the best resolution in the, any kind of a Doppler signal. Um, and this shows another Doppler technology that was flown by NASA Langley. They flew uh, over the wind energy area and they took their Doppler instrument, which they normally use for measuring winds and hurricanes and other storms at, at sea level, but they're flying safely above the storm. And this is a map of the wind speed in the Virginia wind energy area. And you can see the huge gradient. It's not a uniform flowing wind out there, but there's this huge gradient from in this area here, the turbine would barely be turning and here it would be producing rated power. So a six megawatt turbine might be producing a couple of hundred kilowatts at most in this area, uh, but the, a, tur a turbine nearby in this area would be producing full rated power. So this is something we really want to, Dominion and, and, and the state will want to know more about if we're really going to depend on this resource for uh, as part of our future energy portfolio. And this just sort of shows also from that same overflight campaign, it just shows the wind shear and the change in direction from this is the CVAO turbine, the demonstration turbines will have a rotor span of 154 meters. And so this, this shows the hub height, which is uh, a little bit more than 100 meters above sea level. And then the, the tip of the blade would rotate through this lower speed wind, about six meters a second. And the power in that wind is a proportional to velocity cubed. So say if you cube six, that's 36, up to over 10. So now it's 1,000. So now you've got basically 30 times as much power impacting the same blade as it goes, rotates through this very sheared layer. So again, that's really important to understand to, to optimize, not only optimize the energy output, but also to minimize fatigue damage and other kinds of damage to the blade and to the, the whole drivetrain. Um, and we have a much more complicated boundary layer uh, in off the uh, Virginia and Carolina Capes than we have uh, in the North Sea because we have these shallow bays, like the Chesapeake Bay and all of its estuaries, 
We've got uh, Curatuck Sound, Pamlico Sound, Albemarle Sound, Delaware Bay, and then the, the sounds behind the New Jersey Barrier Islands. And all those sounds, they heat up quickly in the summer and they cool down quickly in the winter. And, they, and so they're very big horizontal temperature gradient as the air blows over those bodies of water and then they blow over the Atlantic Ocean. And then we further complicate things off Kitty Hawk in Virginia, we've got the Gulf Stream. So you've got this, when the air comes from the south, it's hitting this really warm, moist air, and then it overcomes this cold air. And so you get these really complicated, like we can, oops, sorry. Ah, error. Let's go back. There we go. So you can see you have this, you have like this low level jet. You've got two peaks, and you've got a very complex structure, not just this, this, this typical profile that you might see in the North Sea. So we need to learn more about that. We also need to learn more about the waves. This is a simulation of, of waves. The maps are a simulation of the waves that were uh, sort of hindcasting, modeling in hindsight of, of Hurricane Isabel. And you can see there are lots of ways that waves lose energy over the continental shelf. Bottom friction, white capping, which you just see when the waves kind of spill and spill as the wind picks up. We call those white horses a lot of times. But then there's surf zone breaking where it, the wave feels the bottom and it can actually impact a, a, a platform. And you can see this is a North Sea storm where the water depth is actually greater than it is where the, where the sea valve turbines are. And a significant wave height of five meters, we get that a lot off Virginia. That's not a weird thing. It's about time. Oh, okay, all right. Okay, all right, all right, all right. So anyway, I'm just about wrapped up. So we have to, we have to be concerned about the breaking waves. Uh, and you can see that when a wave is breaking, it creates a lot more uh, these, the heat, it's, this is the bending moment compared to the blue of a non-breaking wave. And so that breaking wave can have a big impact on how much steel you need. And then I will just finish with this. This is just a, one more look at the whole area. And the other thing is that if we can demonstrate a jacket foundation, Virginia is really well suited to doing those kinds of foundations because we have these terminals that can go out to sea with vertical structures that don't have to worry about hitting bridges. And um, this just shows, the, again, the transport distance, and this is just a, a, a short clip, like 10 seconds of a video. These are the largest cranes in the Western Hemisphere. They just came in a couple of months ago to the Port of Virginia, and these are of the same scale as the foundations for an offshore wind turbine. So, so what you will see here is that's the height. That's what those foundations would look like if they were being built at Portsmouth Marine Terminal or Newport News Marine Terminal. And I'm sorry it took so long. Sorry to cut you short there, George. It was all very interesting um, information. And we will have time for questions after our second presentation for both George and Janine, who's presenting now. Um, so I'll invite them back up to the stage to answer any questions for follow-up. So our, um, let me get you loaded up here. Okay, our next um, presentation is by, um, by uh, Janine Whitkin. Um, she is going to present on New York State Offshore Wind uh, Master Plan and a little bit information about Janine. Um, she is the uh, Principal Project Manager at Ecology and Environment Incorporated. Ms. Whitkin provides strategic planning and management of complex energy projects involving a wide range of technical and regulatory issues throughout the United States. For E&E, Ms. Witkin has led projects for renewable energy, LNG export, carbon sequestration, and natural gas power. Prior to joining E&E, she led permitting and compliance efforts for Constellation, now Exelon, Reliant Energy, and U.S. Generating, uh, generating Company. Ms. Witkins holds a Bachelor of Engineering degree in Civil Environmental Engineering from Stevens Institute of Technology. So please join me in um, welcoming Ms. Uh, Witkin. Thank you. It, it took me a while to think of a fun fact, um, but that was relevant because I couldn't top yours, George. Um, but I have been to the Block Island Wind Farm. Uh, there was a great tour of that, which um, w was uh, very moving. Um, I also just want to make sure I know how to operate. Can I use the mouse to operate this? Yes. And press slide? Yes. Okay. 
thank you for inviting me. Um, and I wanted to actually add, I think we should thank Europe for uh, really starting the commercialization of offshore wind. And I think we are poised to, to finally launch here in, in the US. Um, with respect to the New York State offshore wind master plan, uh, the work uh, started with the governor's goals for renewable energy and this goal of 50% by 2030. In 2016, he started to form the team of consultants and contractors to uh, initiate this plan. Uh, and we came on board. Uh, it has moved, even though it's showing three years there, it, felt, it has felt like it has gone by really fast. Um, we started on the studies really in, in late 2017 and everything was uh, rush, 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 get these done. Um, and we did, we met an incredible time frame. Uh, they released their master plan in 2018. Um, it followed with an, an EIS process, which I'll talk a little bit about, and ultimately issued their procurement for 800 megawatts of offshore wind. Um, bringing us up to this year, I wanted to just do a shout out to Virginia for joining this National Offshore Wind Research and Development Consortium. And um, just a little update on what has uh, happened in the master plan implementation when we get there. So these just show the, the key elements of, 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 the, of the offshore wind master plan. And I'll talk a little bit about each of these. Uh, but ultimately, the goal of the master plan was to uh, reduce costs and reduce uncertainty to really support development of offshore wind off New York. One of the most important elements really was outreach and engagement with, with stakeholders, as you can imagine. Uh, and we started with um, engagement with commercial fishing representatives, elected officials, NGOs, um, the offshore wind industry, uh, federal and state agencies. Uh, we also, or NYSERDA, also hired a local uh, fishing consultant um, with background in the industry, the company's name of Sea Risk. So there was a tremendous effort to really find out who all the, the players were and people with information that, that would be of help to us. Um, there was a lot of uh, methods of outreach from email communication, one-on-one -on -one meetings, web webinexes, uh, webinars, um, um, open house meetings, uh, and we tracked and logged all of that information. One of our biggest lessons learned is if any of you have worked in stakeholder outreach is everybody felt like they didn't have enough time to give us feedback and, and process all the information that we had. So ultimately, um, the th next key element of the study uh, or of the master plan being to identify uh, the site area. Um, we started with the large area to the out of the dotted line in this figure. And I wanted to just present these side by side to show that ultimately the, the master plan identified smaller areas that were opt more optimum, less impact for offshore wind development. One of the ways we got there really was through all of these studies. Um, and E&E &E or Ecology and Environment um, was responsible for the studies in blue. Uh, and there are other team members that did uh, the studies in green. Uh, one, for example, that was useful to us in, in some of our work was the cables, pipelines, and other infrastructure study. Uh, that was done by a company called Renewables Consulting Group. Um, it, it is a really uh, important uh, interlinking study for what we were focusing offshore because they looked at where the cables would make landfall essentially um, and looked at all the constraints that would be involved with that. So I'm going to walk through our, our big picture process. Everybody kind of had the same methodology uh, because there were a, even within E&E, &E, our company, there were 10 different authors and then five other different companies that were all coordinating. So 
We established sort of a streamlined methodology so that we could um, have a, a consistent report at the end and consistent findings, um, as well as really continuing to capture wherever there were information gaps um, to kind of keep in context. You know, we're using the best information available, but we know that there's studies, more studies that need to be done. We didn't want to lose track of all those insights while we were gathering existing data. So I'm going to walk through uh, a couple of the studies. Um, one of the first ones uh, was aviation and radar. Uh, this one was interesting, um, particularly because of all the, the players involved. Uh, we actually have on staff folks that work for the Navy and do work for other branches of the military, so it was a great fit for us. Uh, we engaged with FAA, DOD, Coast Guard, um, really to uh, talk about their concerns with, there's, uh, as you guys know in Virginia, training areas offshore, uh, ships and, and planes. Uh, so they were very sensitive about uh, development of this area. Um, one of the things that this study also did was look at the visual impacts of the lighting that the FAA would require on the towers. And one of the cool things about that is if, if they're as off, far offshore as we plan, um, they really are not uh, going to affect people onshore uh, and, and destroying their, their view of the horizon at night with the lights out there. Um, another aspect of this study was it, it demonstrated and, and used, there's a couple interesting tools. There's a DOD tool that's a screening tool, and there's a NOAA tool called Next Generation Radar, Next Rad Screening. So um, this study kind of uh, takes that and shows you how it could be used. This was a favorite study of um, our on-staff marine archaeologist, as you can imagine. Um, his uh, first task was really a database research, desktop analyses, looked through everything that BOEM had done previously, National Park Service, um, and in New York, it's the Office of Parks, Recreation, and Historic Preservation. Um, and you, as you can see, there's literally hundreds of, of cultural resources, and uh, the majority of them clearly are closer to shore. Um, another uh, interesting thing is this looked at lots of uh, the cables, uh, telegraph cables that had been installed, and we have a uh, claim to the first transatlantic telegraph cable that was designed and built in 1884 from the Azores to Nova Scotia to Rockaway, New York. So that was a cultural resource that obviously would need to be avoided um, and not, not disturbed here. But ultimately, you can see in our dotted line area, um, the spacing between these resources, generally, you know, we, we could avoid the majority of them. Another interesting one was uh, looking at the presence of resources for mining sand and gravel. Uh, but we also kind of did a, a broad look at, at resources on the seabed uh, it was uh, any former or current um, mining sites as well as dredge disposal sites. We kind of lumped those in here too since um, there, are off there are offshore disposal areas. We came up with uh, 120 uh, different sites uh, that um, really ultimately would not be a constraint to siting, uh, but we were able to go through this and, and check that box. As I'm sure you all can relate to here in, in Virginia, too, uh, recreational use uh, in New York, New Jersey area was a, a key concern. Uh, so we made sure that was one of the studies that we, again, gathered all the background information that we could on the types of activities, the types of vessels, the time of year, everything ranging from, you know, the traditional uh, sail races that happen every year to um, weekend use, something to catalog and inventory 
that level of activity. Um, again, because part of that was stakeholders wanted to make sure we knew uh, what was important to them. Um, and uh, that was a primary goal. And it also allowed us to capture and catalog feedback, uh, again, on how to avoid impacts. Turning a little bit more to biology, um, for, for the first uh, study on this, we really looked at all the existing databases on uh, the presence of essential fish habitat, uh, protected habitat, uh, fish populations, fisheries, I mean, not only from a biology perspective, but ultimately connected to commercial fishing and, and their concerns as well. Um, this study uh, catalogs all of that baseline information, and it also puts together with it um, all the summarizes all the applicable regulations. So there's, it's like a primer if you need it on um, all the federal regulations that protect fish and fisheries. Um, and the goal was to you know put those two things together in, in some ways to to demonstrate that we have a really good regulatory uh, structure uh, for protecting fish and, and fisheries already. Um, for our area, we had uh, 52 species in our essential fish habitat. We broke it into a grid and analyzed each grid. Uh, we did not have any seagrass or nurseries or sanctuaries, um, but we did look closely at Atlantic sturgeon, white-tipped shark, um, giant manta. Um, and that's in the fish side. So going to marine mammals and, and sea turtles. Um, this was primarily a review based on uh, density and occurrence. And we used the NOAA stock assessment reports for that. Uh, and, their, and their probability of occurring in our study area. Uh, particularly North Atlantic right whales, of course. Um, and Actually, I um, kind of want to go directly to the, to the next study, um, which took all of our data that we had gathered on marine mammals and, and sea turtles and fish and fisheries and started to put it into an environmental sensitivity model. Um, our objective was to uh, translate uh, in an in a, uh, easy way the knowledge that we had, were collecting about stressors and the probability of risk occurring uh, to these different species. So uh, next what we did was work with NGOs and uh, the, the uh, agency folks and other biologists and put together uh, this relative weighting of these stressors uh, for these species of concern, depending on the stage of development of, the, of, of a wind project. So some of the things that were included, obviously, you know, in pre-construction, you have more vessel traffic and noise from pile driving, um, and that affected the weighting in that column. Post-construction, you know, some maintenance vessels going out periodically, um, but um, not the same type of risks. And ultimately, um, this was fed into a GIS-based model, and you guys may have heard the term heat mapping already, but essentially the same concept as, as heat mapping, uh, t to look at the three phases of construction and different times of the year. and. Basically, you know, it, it showed us that um, the fall, you know, has, has less activity, so we would have less impacts. Um, the spring season during construction is obviously, the, with all the red and the yellow, uh, the, the critical period where we would have the most impacts. So we could easily demonstrate in an independent way to folks um, that this would be the time period to avoid 
um, the noise producing activities or even um, additional vessel traffic, uh, s anything that would help uh, reduce impacts. Um, the, the use of that uh, structure, the suction uh, jacket, um, would be a game changer because uh, there, there would not be uh, those noise impacts during construction. So this one is my personal favorite because um, I was the task manager for, for this study. Um, and um, if you have done any work in uh, NEPA uh, or uh, something similar and you, and you have any familiarity with cumulative impacts analysis, your goal is to take the impacts of your proposed project and um, add it to the impacts of other reasonably foreseeable projects at, that occur in the same space and the, and the same time and uh, look at whether or not cumulatively you, you've found that straw that breaks the camel's back, so to speak. So since we didn't have a real project, we developed a model plant. Um, ours was a 400 megawatt project, uh, 50 turbines. We were looking far ahead, so they were eight megawatts each, um, pretty big. Um, and uh, basically we uh, evaluated impacts of that one project and then added it assuming all 2400 megawatts that New York State has in mind uh, would be built in that area that dotted line that I showed you earlier um, and and ultimately the finding was that for the majority of impacts there's enough space to uh, site a wind farm properly to uh, avoid significant impacts. Um, we even, uh, based on current design, the turbines are about a mile apart. Um, but there were uh, still areas that uh, we would say there are potential for cumulative impacts that we need to figure out. One would be impacts on fish from the noise during pile driving. That is still a concern. Um, and marine mammals and sea turtles, uh, concern about increased vessel traffic. If you were building 2,400 megawatts in that area, even at, even at 16,000 acres, um, is still a concern from the sheer number of vessels, the fact that the, the species use their own lanes of, of uh, migration, um, that, that some um, some uh, strikes, vessel strikes, would be unavoidable. And, and ultimately, we've not really been able to satisfy uh, commercial and recreational fishermen completely yet that um, the two industries can coexist without impacts on them. Uh, one is, you know, they don't want to disclose their favorite fishing spot, so they don't want you to build there. And then where you build may become a great fishing spot because of the structures that you put underground. So um, that's something that'll have to be worked on over time. This study, we, we also were hoping again to reduce those barriers to developers. If it, the attempt for doing a cumulative analysis was again to show when, when you are in this position five years from now or 10 years uh, from now, we've tried to tackle some of the questions that everybody's gonna have about whether or not you can have this many megawatts in that area. Um, so we're, we're hoping this will be a model for developers. So that really kind of ended the phase of the offshore wind master plan and then New York State was ready to issue their procurement for 800 megawatts. Uh, because they have a State Environmental Quality Review Act, uh, they have to uh, undergo a equivalent uh, you know, EIS process for a decision like that procurement. So the next thing that we did was a generic EIS for them to procure 800 megawatts of, of offshore wind in the short term and 2,400 by, by 2030. Um, and this was a, a real mind bender for us uh, or anybody who's ever practiced NEPA uh, because the, the 
area that we were looking at, it, New York is, is connected to the grid through PJM as well as um, New England. So technically the power that they procure could, have come, could come from Block Island Wind Farm or something off the coast of North Carolina. So our, our area affected by, by this procurement was that entire coast. Um, and, and basically we systematically went through and looked at all the areas we call resource areas, fish and fisheries and visual impacts, uh, cultural resources, all of those and, and uh, evaluated impacts. A uh, key part of this is really incorporating what BOEM has already set forth for mitigation strategies. Um, and ultimately, you may know they issued the procurement for 800 megawatts of wind and they are uh, evaluating those proposals. So real quick, this is the next stage are called technical working groups. E&E is actually leading the fisheries technical working group and to that issue about vessel traffic, there's actually a meeting today uh, gathering all the, a bunch of the same people and their goal for their meeting is to come out with recommended like traffic lanes for the offshore wind industry to use to avoid impacts to commercial fisheries and impacts to species as well. So last slide is to ha give you the link if you wanted to go get the studies and uh, our information if, if you have any questions. And so we'll okay. invite you now to um, ask any questions um, that you might have for either one of our presenters. And thank you again so much for all the information. I know, wish we had more time for both of you to share more on what you were presenting on. Um, but are there any um, follow-up questions? Right, uh, right here. It was a, you mean visual impacts? Yeah, it, it really, um, I'm sorry, I was probably yelling loud enough you could hear me, right? Um, it, very similar to how we do a visual impacts analysis on land, you identify observation points uh, and you work on line of sight and we didn't do any um, sophisticated uh, photo simulations, um, but ultimately the, the conclusion was the distance and the curvature of the earth at that distance um, that folks on land at key observation points would, would not see the turbines. That was done, we, one of the studies that was done by EDR out of New York. You are correct, that is, a, the Benthic study is one that I didn't cover up here, but uh, yes, uh, that was looked at, absolutely. Um, um, and the, the uh, foundation is one of the biggest issues with the, the Benthic species as well. Um, that monopile and its footprint, I mean, these things are, are huge in diameter. Um, so if you could go to that jacket foundation um, that would also reduce impacts to benthic species a lot. Plus, in that area of the country, clams and scallops, there's a big scallop um, commercial fishing operation up there, so they were um, pretty sensitive to the amount of uh, seafloor we were going to disturb and, and uh, where we'd be in their way.
If I, if I understand your question, I'd have to say we, we, we looked at them more by phase, so it was more like an absolute as opposed to when you got to post-construction. I, if I hear what you're saying is after all those years, um, what impacts were additive? Um, and just from the, the, the conclusions that we, uh, I guess what we, what we strongly believed is that we could put uh, procedures in place that would minimize or mitigate those impacts in each phase. Um, we look so closely like at pile driving and the distances that um, different species of fish would be affected, you know, in, in thousands of feet or hundreds of feet, depending on what it was. So the expectation was that maybe, first of all, you wouldn't be doing any pile driving in the spring where there are high populations there. Um, but secondly, that you um, would um, have to have some sort of mitigation uh, in place uh, in order to do pile driving. There's uh, bubble curtains that they use and things like that. So um, a lot of that was, was built into our thinking. Yeah, that's something we didn't address. I don't know, um, but I, I, I think it would be very similar to decommissioning of any offshore equipment like offshore rigs. Um, I, I believe a lot of those are retired in place, uh, but I, I'm not sure if the same would apply here. They're scheduled to be installed in the summer of 2020. The actual construction window is notionally from the 1st of April to the end of September um, uh, of 2020. Um, and the one of the things about this project that makes it different from Block Island, it's the first offshore wind project done in federal waters. And as you've probably gathered uh, from, uh, from Janine's presentation that the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, they have a very proscribed regulatory process, including all the NEPA co consultation and the NEPA documents and the environmental impact statements. And so Block Island being in state waters had much lower regulatory burden. So what's happening is Dominion is already learning, even though, though the construction hasn't started and won't start for another 16 months. Um, Dominion has already learned a great deal and sort of blazed away for other projects, including the ones off Massachusetts, because if you go to the, the research activities plan for the two demonstration turbines, it's very much a template, if you will, for the construction and operations plan that uh, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management will require for all 15 leaseholders. And so, so there's already learning coming from that, and then as we install and as they're tested, Will, will gain these measurements. And so, so even though they haven't been installed, there's been a benefit already, but as they are installed and then as we, as we monitor and instrument the, uh, some of the, the studies I described, we'll learn even more to inform the design of the commercial project, not only off Virginia, but off Kitty Hawk and off New Jersey, Delaware, because it's, again, very similar ocean space. In fact, we'll probably learn a lot that would inform any commercial projects in the New York Bight. Unfortunately, we don't have a, uh, so there's the Jones Act, some of you may have heard that, and it mainly means that you cannot, you cannot uh, land goods and then transship them again uh, in, in, on a, on a non-U.S. vessel. The vessels have to be flagged to U.S. And, and these, the, the, the cranes and the jack-up vessels with the capacity to lift those, uh, the, the monopiles and to do the towers and to bolt on 
the, the nacelle and do all that work. We just don't have any vessels that are in the U.S. because we've never had a market. So there, there is no turbine installation vessel. So the way these will be installed, the way they're installed off Block Island is the, the main turbine components came over from France and the vessel literally parked offshore. And then there were shuttles mobilized from the Gulf of Mexico, because again, we don't even have lift boats, which they do have in the Gulf of Mexico. But these, these lift boats would shuttle the blades out and the towers out and uh, the tower sections, and then they would park alongside the much larger turbine installation vessel, which was flagged Norwegian. And it would, and all that installation happened offshore. Now, in the case of Seavow, that's actually pretty costly and risky to have these lift boats, and you're, every time you, you do a, a transfer across a quayside, you're, you're running risk and you've got potential damage. And so the, the whole kit and caboodle will come over on the turbine installation vessel, blades, towers, uh, tower sections and the cells, and it'll, it'll just park offshore. And the only time it would come into the port of Hampton Roads is in the event of a storm. The, the Jones Act does allow for harbor of safe haven, and obviously even in July we can get hurricanes, as you know. So, so there does have to be a provision to get that vessel inshore for safety purposes, but otherwise it'll just stay offshore. Have, oops, sorry. We don't have a, uh, a, a, a master plan like New York, uh, in part because we've done a lot of those work. So a lot of the work has, it's not been done as part of a master coordinated plan. But for example, we've already put LIDAR buoys offshore. We've done two port studies. We've done the, some of the, geo, the reconnaissance level geophysical and geotechnical surveys. We've done a whole fisheries. Uh, the DEQ did a great job, again, with uh, coordinating with uh, funding from both DMME and the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, did a whole fisheries, both recreational and commercial fisheries. So we've done a lot of those elements, and I think there's some agreement among the community in Virginia that it would be good to catalog all that and make that available at sort of a one-stop shop. And there is a, that web address that was on the last slide. Eventually, that's going to become a central clearinghouse for all the information we've already developed. And the other thing that is that happened and I don't know, but actually this is a kind of a question I would also have for Janine, which is when, when Virginia was one of the first, it was actually the second one after Rhode Island that was auctioned off. And so there was a whole in, uh, NEPA process, an environmental impact uh, assessment of, for just lease, sale, and site assessment. So none of the construction of the turbine, but just actually awarding a lease and then doing the Met Ocean uh, analysis, putting buoys offshore or met mass offshore, and Virginia, Delaware, New Jersey, and Maryland were all in the so-called smart from the start. So they had a blanket environmental impact assessment with a finding of no significant impact for lease issuance and any of the site assessment activities. And I was curious, how does the, the New York master plan, does that satisfy the NEPA requirement for lease issuance and, and site assessment off New York for those areas in the New York bite? Not the one that's already been auctioned, but the other ones? Well, on, only to the extent it would be for those activities. And, and any new project, right, is still going to have to go to the next level, do their site assessment plan. And, um, but it only functioned in the same way that it did for, for Virginia. Okay. Yeah. So, so, so in fact, it's, been, it's been more of a patchwork. More of a patchwork in Virginia, because we were one of. I know people don't think of Virginia as taking the lead in offshore wind, but actually we wore the second one, the second lease auctioned uh, in in the Mid Atlantic Bight, at, only after Rhode Island. That was only a month after Rhode Island was auctioned off. So, so we have, being early on, we I guess a lot of our sort of fits and starts in doing things has now informed some of the more coordinated efforts that are happening, say in New York and Massachusetts. Um, but I think we have many of those elements. But I think it would be useful to sort of catalog those and make those accessible to the public so they can see what's been done and where there still may be gaps. So a lot, of, a lot of it depends on what do you mean by practical. I mean, so, so in you know, Virginia, unlike every other state that's got leases offshore to the north of us, is we are a regulated uh, energy market. So that means that 
the, 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 our, our public utility commission, if you will, which is the state corporation commission, they are every year review what, what the plan is for new generation, and it's always got to be the least cost generation. So in Virginia, we have very low cost of energy, roughly six and a half cents a kilowatt hour for large industrial customers. It's double that in New England and off New York. In New York, it's even higher. So in terms of where the first projects are going to be economical, I won't say practical, but they're going to be economical, they're going to be, they're going to be able to compete and not cost the ratepayers there more money. It's going to be off New England because their conventional price of energy is double ours, and their winds are faster. The winds off the they're about a mile, I mean a meter per second on average faster off New England than they are off the Virginia and Carolina Capes. So those two facts, which are just facts, they have nothing to do with a political situation or anything else. It's just that the the market for the energy is 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 more real, is more business. Uh, if, if people want, the, if they don't want their utility bills to go up and there aren't subsidies, which we don't typically do in Virginia, then, um, yeah, I think we're going as fast as we can. I mean, I think a lot of us were surprised. Well, I was, anyway. I can only speak for me. I was very surprised when Dominion actually took the lead in doing a, a technology demonstration project early on. Um, um, so anyway, I think, I think, and I think we are going to be the first to really learn about the impacts of hurricanes. Block Island is actually fairly sheltered. If you look at hurricane tracks, it doesn't have the kind of hurricane exposure that we have off Virginia where the research lease is.